Okay, guys, thank you for coming. The, the last one this half term, we're going to have a break for two weeks while you go off and do your revision and exams. And then we'll have three last sessions on the last three Mondays. Okay, so we'll resume 21st of June. Um, there are a few people who are talking then who still owe me their final title. So if you could do that, please, in the next few days, that would be really good. But we'll resume 21st of June. Anyway, um, without further ado, we've got Megan kicking us off on history and development of veterinary medicine. Okay, right, you tell me when you want me to click. But I think yeah. we're there. Okay, over okay, to you, Megan. The field of veterinary medicine is concerned with prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases affecting health, domestic, and wild animals, as well as preventing the transmission of animal diseases to people. The health of animals is vital to the health of humans. Of nearly 1,500 diseases will now affect people, 2,000 pass between animals and humans. Three out of four emerging diseases have come to humans through animals. Vet Street illnesses and injuries to surgical and medical procedures, dental work, and vaccinating animals against diseases. It is hard to imagine now there is a time when cats, dogs, and other domestic animals were not cared for by a family. In fact, it was not until the early 1900s that pets began to more commonly receive medical care. I will take you on a journey through the history of veterinary medicine to consider the ancient and old years, modern eras of the development of the science. There are many vague sources of the beginnings of veterinary medicine. These start in ancient times in a variety of places such as Egypt and the Middle East. The first known veterinary practice here was being in 9000 BC. Sheep herders use rudimentary medical skills to treat their animals, which included the dogs of their house. Ancient humans began domesticating cats, fowls, and dogs, and their owners considered them as members of their household, like many of us do today. Approximately one, in 1900 BC, the first written accounts of veterinary medicine were made in four sacred Hindu texts. With these texts, two distinct writings outlined the separate fields of human and animal medicine. The term veterinarius was first written about by a Roman scholar in the first century AD. He was the person who bore the role of veterinarian from just a soldier who looked after the horse to a person who looked after livestock. He wrote books on animal hair and related subjects like livestock, health, and breeding. From this time onwards, there were references to veterinarians in veterinary practices like literature. Until the 1700s, veterinary medicine was still considered veterinary art rather than veterinary science. Veterinary medicine was said to have properly started in 1761 in Lyon, France, where a man called Claude Bourgeois founded the first veterinary school. It was here that the scientific study of veterinary medicine was officially born. Next in Britain, the field of veterinary medicine had its roots in the early Camp Agricultural Society. This society was the first to apply scientific principles to the treatment of animals. Following this, in 1791, the London Veterinary College was founded, marking the start of the British veterinary profession. During the 18th century, the veterinary profession was still centered mainly on courts, and this remained the focus for many years, influenced by the needs of the army. Towards the late 18th century, as human medicine flourished and progressed, so did veterinary medicine. From the late 18th and early 19th century, many treatments for diseases such as cholera, typhoid fever, and TB were discovered. By applying these treatments to animals, livestock could be protected from the same deadly diseases. During the 19th century, many scientific principles were discovered, and many historians refer to this period as a time of enlightenment. The most important discoveries of this time included the development of rabies and anthrax vaccinations. In the modern day, both of these specific diseases are listed by the OIE, the widely known as the World Organization for Animal Health. This is an international organization which coordinates and promotes animal disease control. Also in this century, veterinary journals were launched for public reading. One of these was called the Veterinarian, and was shown in this picture. This particular journal was published for 74 years and contained the latest news in the veterinary industry. The veterinary record established in 1888 and the veterinary journal established in 1875, though still in existence today, and published peer unpublished peer reviewed articles in all aspects of veterinary science. In 1844, the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons was formed after the Royal Charter was granted. Veterinary practice became a profession distinguished by the title of veterinary surgeon. 
Thomas Turner was the first president of the RCBS from 1847 to 1851. In 1881, the Bethany Surgeons Act was passed. This established a register and imposed restrictions so that no one could take the title of a Bethany Surgeon without passing the examination of the Royal College of Bethany Surgeons. A famous fact in the 19th century was the Danish, Danish man, Bernard Ritz Frederick Bang, who discovered the Bruxelles disease in 1897. This particular disease especially affected cows and could result in calves being aborted, whilst also causing fever in humans. He created the vaccine and made huge improvements to the health of cattle, whilst contributing to advancements in human medicine also. Other important developments during this century were the diagnosis of rhino pest. This is a disease in clothing from farm animals, such as cows and sheep. Animals which have contracted this disease and have life threatening improvements. A final discovery of sheep pox imported animals. This led to new regulations to control the importation and exportation of animals. The 20th century was a century like no other. It was a hundred years of the most change. The 1900s opened with a still young profession, composed of entirely men, almost exclusively dealing with horses. The century closed with a profession that was rapidly dominated by females, mostly practicing from hospital like facilities and devoted to domestic animals. The desire and need to care for animals led to the swift development and progress of veterinary practice. It was in the 20, 20th century that more people realized the importance of veterinary medicine, and therefore more educational institutes for specialized training were set up. At the turn of the century, there were four privately funded veterinary schools. 100 years later, there were six schools and all integrated into the university system. In the early 20th century, equine medicine was the most important outlet for veterinary work. In World War I, 8 million horses were killed, and there were 1,700 vets serving the British Army. In the post-war era, with exponential rise in motorized vehicles, the focus on equine medicine shifted. Over time, the interest of the profession spread to cattle and other livestock. The dairy, pig, and poultry industries significantly grew due to the involvement of vets. During the 20th century, the Small Animal Veterinary Association was formed. Nowadays, this association is a prominent part of the veterinary industry. In the 20th century, major diseases such as brucellosis and rhino pests were eradicated, and specific vaccines against other diseases such as foot and mouth and avian flu were produced. In 1919, the National Veterinary Medical Association, the NVMA, was formed, which in 1952 became known as the British Veterinary Association. This organisation is the national body of veterinary surgeons in the United Kingdom. Its purpose is to support vets and to profoundly help to animal welfare and food production. And in 1984, it founded the BBA Animal Welfare Foundation. The Veterinary Surgeons Act was updated in 1948, 1966, 1971, and again in 1986, each time changing, changing to reflect the development of the profession and clinical advancements. By the end of the 20th century, vets were introduced to the public health system. Official veterinarians are employed by the Food Standards Agency, and their responsibilities include ensuring that the correct and humane slaughter of animals is carried out in all abattoirs, as well as detecting the signs of disease that may affect humans and animal health. The latter half of the century also saw welfare societies caring for dogs, cats, and organisations devoted to horses and other species. Many of these activities require veterinary involvement. A very famous 20th century vet was Dr. James Alfred Wright, who may know him better as James Herriot. He was both a vet and an author. He wrote a series of books set in the 1930s vet practice in Yorkshire Dales. There have been several television and film adaptations of his books, including the BBC television series, All Creatures Great and Small. His books have gone on to inspire many people to enter the veterinary industry. Veterinary medicine is a branch of health science which has gained a lot of importance in today's times, where we care a lot about pets and animals in general. The interest in this industry has been rapidly expanding for years. In the year 1900, there were over 3,417 members of the RCBS. However, by the year 2000, there were 19,226. Advancements in veterinary technology, radiology, and diagnosis continue to improve our ability to detect disease earlier. Our increasing knowledge of the cause of disease helped to educate on disease prevention. Attitudes about animals and the rise in the number of domestic pets have also prompted changes in how we look after our animals. This now includes things such as dental hygiene and grooming. The development and advances in anesthesia has made surgery much safer and more effective for animals, and a better understanding of pain management 
allows us to provide the best quality of life we can. There have been great medical breakthroughs within the last decade. Laparoscopy, a procedure to using a camera and a light that is inserted into the abdominal cavity to see inside the animal's body. This leads to easier and less invasive operations. The ability to prove 3D objects can be applied to veterinary medicine to create models of the animal's bones, so vets can go into operations with a clearer image of the problem. They are also able to create intricate replicate parts of animals' bodies, for example, in their knee joints. As strange as it sounds, animal acupuncture, this can treat diseases ranging from hip dysplasia to chronic joint disease. Nowadays, there are a variety of career paths that a qualified veterinarian can take. Many vets specialize in exotic animals, zoonos, or even the fields of medicine such as oncology or cardiology. Vets are also very prominent in the food industry, such as in abattoirs. Surprisingly, vets are often present on films next to you to ensure the well being of any animal film stars. Veterinary medicine holds a bright future in which modern day technology will keep advancing. More developed technology will ensure treatments are achieved more quickly and effectively, whilst improving accuracy, enhancing the team available, and increasing the probability of success. Artificial intelligence in the veterinary industry is a growing possibility. Robots could be used for a variety of tasks, such as assisting in surgery or for sanitation. A new robot group called the Da Vinci Robot is used in laparoscopic surgeries. This robot is designed to increase visibility, precision, and flexibility during surgery and can contribute to the success of an operation. Furthermore, researchers from different institutes around the world are working on designing a micro miniature robot which will be able to move through the body fluids and deliver drugs in a highly targeted way or to perform precise procedures. So far, a group of scientists have designed soft, flexible, and motorless white robots that can swim and move in the of bacteria. The biggest challenge is to keep on top of the changing standards and emerging trends and new drugs, therapies, and treatments in the field. The veterinary role in food production has never been greater. It is essential that food animal vets continue to work with livestock industries to identify and practice solutions which ensure animal health and well being, but fulfill high consumer demand. Vets are important for global security and safety too. This has never been more relevant now. Current trends show that there is a growing incidence of infectious and zoonotic diseases that puts humans and animals at risk due to threats of disease outbreaks and even global pandemics. And if you have a question on Zoom as well, um, we can we can take some questions from Zoom. Are there any questions from folks watching on Zoom? Mr. Grant's looking like there might be, but your microphone's off. <laughs> No, I'm not sure we have uh, here. The, the sound quality was not very good, so it was very difficult to hear what was being, uh, being, being said to be able to focus a question particularly on there. And it may well be that um, the, the one question I think that I'd like to know, and, and maybe you answered it already, Megan, is what, what the, most, the single most significant um, uh, veterinary development has been um, I think probably the 3D printing because um, it helps vets go into operations know what they're doing, but also can produce parts that um, can be used in surgery as well. Okay, thank you very much. 
And then there's a question from Mrs. Hall. Do you think that the hu that human medicine can learn from animal medicine? Yeah, definitely. I read somewhere that um, there's a cancer vaccine that can be used on dogs for a particular type of skin cancer, which um, you can't use in humans yet, but they're using the information from veterinary medicine for that. I suppose I have an old question. Do, do you want to be a vet? Yeah. And what do you want to specialise in? I'm not quite sure yet. Okay. Small ones. Small ones, not horses. No. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Right. Over to you, Hannah. Um, thank you, Megan. That was really, really good and um, just really interesting. I thought it was particularly fascinating, actually. So I hadn't really thought particularly before about how sort of important it is for vets to be in places that have the flowers when they're passing sort of diseases into food that humans are eating. I think that's sort of something that I haven't really thought about before. So we really need to take care about that. So thank you very much. It's really fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Right, Joe's up next. All right, bye, Mr. Grant. Right, okay, so Joe is going to talk to us about Antarctica. Should we ban tourism? Is this going to be much longer than just the answer? Yes. No, it's going to be quite long. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Off you go. Next slide. Okay, so before looking at tourism in Antarctica as a whole, I'm going to give you a bit of background on them. Antarctica is known as a global common, meaning it's an area that falls outside of national jurisdictions and to which all nations have access to it. So, why is Antarctica so important to us? For many, this question is obvious. It's home to 235 animal species, including the famous world-renowned penguin. It's at the forefront of climate change, the polar regions being critical for reflecting back UV light, known as the albedo effect, helping to cool down our warming planet. But it's also important as it reveals the impact of human activity on Earth. Locked within the four kilometer deep ice sheets in Antarctica, scientists can discover what the planet's natural climate cycles have been and man's impact upon it. There are many other reasons why Antarctica is so important to us humans, but I hope these reasons alone are enough for you to realise how Antarctica is worth protecting. When I first started this project, my first thought was why? Why the hell would someone want to go to Antarctica in the first place? But the more research I did, the more, sorry, the more research I did, the more answers to my question I got. One of the main reasons why people want to visit Antarctica is for the wildlife. Next slide, please. Behind me are some of the examples of some examples of the spectacular wildlife Antarctica has to offer to its tourists. Who wouldn't want to see some of these guys in their natural habitat? Photography is also a massive reason why people travel to Antarctica. Moreover, there was a general increase in the trend of adventure tourism prior to COVID, of course, and people were becoming more well traveled as places became more accessible. People turned to Antarctica for a very different experience. Also, people wanting to become more educated in issues such as climate change and their effects in Antarctica. And there's a sense of people wanting to travel to Antarctica before, time, before climate change has its full effects on Antarctica and potentially ruins it in the future. Next slide, please. Signed in 1959 by 12 original nations and coming into effect in 1961, the Antarctic Treaty is regarded as one of the most successful treaties of all time. And it's a great example of how global governance can work. Its purpose, setting out clear rules, such as banning military activities in Antarctica and preventing nuclear testing, and encouraging international collaboration in scientific research. As many countries, like our own British Antarctic Survey, have scientists living and working in Antarctica. Originally, the treaty was made due to the threat of the Cold War, but today, Antarctica faces many different threats, one of which is its over-commercialisation and tourism, which I'll be looking into in more detail. Next slide, please. The Antarctic Treaty currently doesn't prevent tourists from being in Antarctica, but you must require a permit from a country within the Antarctic Treaty. To get a permit, the visitor must agree on adhering to certain rules and guidelines. The Antarctic Treaty's Protocol on Environmental Protection, signed in 1991, 
is the only international agreement designed to protect an entire continent. It enables human activity and well-managed environmentally sensitive tourism to occur. So to put all this into perspective, I want you all to imagine that Oliver Booth decides one winter that he's bored of his usual winter holiday and decides Antarctica is the place for him. He must first get a special permit from the Secretary of State and Commonwealth Affairs. And if you break any of the rules granted with getting this permit, Mr. Booth, you'll be, you'll be given a two-year prison sentence. However, the most common way tourists actually book Antarctic, Antarctic holidays is through tour operators, where they individually have their own permits and get constant environmental assessments. Failing one of these assessments leads to a confiscation of the, of the tour operator's permit. Next slide, please. The IAATO represents Antarctic tour operators today, and there are, there are more than 100 members of this organisation. To be part of this organisation, you have to make sure your tourism is responsible. Therefore, being part of this organization, make sure that the tour operator is being legitimate. And if you're a tourist, you may check that your tour operator is an, is an IAATO member before you go. Next slide, please. Behind me is a graph showing the, showing the years of, uh, between 2002 to 2019 of current tourist numbers. This graph shows a general increase in tourist numbers in Antarctica. But why? Why is this the case? Tourism pre COVID 19 was a growing industry. And the media is made people more aware of extreme environments, such as David Attenborough's documentaries, Watched by Millions. For example, Blue Planet 2, which had Antarctica as one of its main features, was watched by over 14 million people alone. There's also been a general trend towards adventure and eco tourism, and people in general have more disposable income around the world. Countries are getting richer. Also, population growth is a factor. Between 2002 to 2019, the population grew by more than 1.5 billion people. This bar graph behind me also has two colours, orange, which represents all the tourists that visit Antarctica in that year, and blue, which represents those who step on land. It's worth noting that those who step on land pose more of an environmental danger, such as bringing in invasive species on people's beaches. Next slide, please. This pie chart shows tourist nationalities. All countries represented on this chart are Antarctic treaty members. Unsurprisingly, as the countries within the treaty are ones with most connections with Antarctica. You can go to Antarctica without being from a treaty sign nation, however, you can't get your own personal permit. Another observation is that all these nations are developed wealthy countries. Again, unsurprising, your average cost for an Antarctic holiday is around $10,000 $10, per person. To put this into some context, your average week's holiday in Spain is only $1,000 per person, so Antarctica is 10 times more expensive than the average week's holiday in Spain. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's start with the positives of this tour. First, and in, and in my opinion, the most significant, creating environmental ambassadors. Now, this sounds a bit weird, but what this actually means is people go there to become more environmentally aware, go home, and spread the news to friends and family. This is an example of a domino effect. Perhaps this environmental awareness will cause people to change their personal habits for the environment. It's also important to realise that this is a place where nobody lives, so there are no natives to speak up for Antarctica. Due to the Antarctic Treaty system and strict rules and regulations on tour operators, tourism does seem to be very well managed. Antarctica is in fact known for having the best managed tourism industry in the world, and perhaps other nations can learn from it. An example of Antarctica being well managed is the 2009 ban on big cruise ships, as they cause two significant threats. One, an, an oil spill would pose a significant threat to the Antarctic pristine environment, especially at sea breaches. And number two, any rescues of, the, of these big ships would be very difficult given the number of people on board. This explains earlier on on the bar chart why tourist numbers did fall in 2009. This was due to the ban of large cruise ships. Most of the tourism that goes on in Antarctica could be described as ecotourism, meaning having little impact on the environment and promoting conservation. For example, tourists here talk about Antarctica's environment on board their boats every day. Finally, traveling to Antarctica is expensive. Tourists therefore tend to be more affluent and consequently more educated. Many people who go to Antarctica in the first place would describe themselves as environmentalists, so they are more likely to be receptive to the message of conservation and stick to the rules and guidelines. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm just moving on to the next. Tourist numbers currently massively outnumber scientific personnel in Antarctica. The greatest number of scientists in Antarctica at one time is around 4,000 people. In 2018 to 2019 season alone, there were 55,489 tourists. This could be an issue, 
as if torus numbers keep climbing, which they are, and in 2019 to 2020 season, there were 74,000 torus, the management of tourism will become harder. And the other three bullet points on this slide behind me will all have bigger effects. Due to Antarctica being such an isolated region from the rest of the world, Antarctic species haven't developed ways of defending themselves. Taurus may accidentally bring in season their boots on knowing these invasive species. As a result, whenever you get on or off a tourist boat, you must clean all your boots and clothing and you'll be checked on this. Taurus they get off the boats may disrupt Antarctica's environment too and wildlife. For instance, there are, record, there are records of birds abandoning their nests near Antarctic bases due to human activity. Antarctica's ice sheets are melting six times faster today than they were in the 1990s, according to NASA satellites. This has caused Antarctica to become more accessible by day, potentially, potentially leading to Antarctica becoming too commercialized. This is a threat as if visiting Antarctica becomes more normalized, perhaps, perhaps other activities such as mining will, will become easier to promote. Next slide, please. This ship was the Envy Explorer, which sank in 2007 due to an inexperienced, cap inexperienced and overconfident captain who drove too quickly. Luckily, all 154 people on board this ship were rescued. However, the diesel, oil, and gasoline on board being spilled had a tragic effect on Antarctica's sea breaches. Next slide, please. Okay, so to answer the question, should we ban Antarctic tourism directly? I personally would say no, no, we should not ban. I understand that there are many negative impacts of tourism in general. However, Antarctica has even greater threats such as climate change and illegal fishing and whaling. I'm sure many of you have seen the series um, Sea Spiracy on Netflix showing some of this. I believe through my research, tourism is being very well managed. And in my mind, the environmental ambassadors for the environment is the most important thing due to Antarctica's lack of native population. Of course, I don't want to mention the sea word too often, but COVID-19 has suppressed tourism in, Ant in Antarctica meaning since 2020, barely anyone has gone. It will be interesting to see how quickly tourist numbers return to pre-pandemic levels. The difference is there is a vaccine for coronavirus, but there is no good cure for habitat loss and species loss. And tourism helps people to witness what's happening and promote the environmental change needed to stop this. Finally, I'm gonna leave you with this quote. What happens in Antarctica doesn't stay in Antarctica. Thank you.